Everybody's heard about the Aztecs. Everybody's heard about the Maya. But before the Aztecs and before the Maya, there were a culture who are referred to as the Olmecs. I explored the Olmec mystery uh, in considerable depth. At the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, an era brimming with curiosity and the spirit of discovery, the ancient civilizations of Mesoamerica began to captivate scholars and adventurers alike. This period, steeped in Victorian era fascination, saw ancient cultures not as relics of the past, but as windows into a grand, albeit lost, world. The settlement story of the Americas is much more complicated uh, than we've, you know, than we than we've realized. Fueled by a mix of exploration, colonization, and a penchant for romanticizing the unknown, people were drawn to the mysteries that ancient societies held. Institutions in Europe and the United States, including museums and universities, recognized the value of understanding these indigenous civilizations. They began to fund expeditions, not just for the sake of collecting artifacts, but to delve deeper into the history and culture of these ancient peoples. This marked a significant shift in archaeology, transforming it from a quest for treasures to a scientific discipline focused on careful excavation and analysis. This is part of a, a curious mystery that is not unconnected to the genetic mystery. The Olmec civilization, with its colossal heads and intricate stone structures, was one of the earliest to be uncovered. Yet in these initial stages, many artifacts were mistakenly attributed to the more familiar Maya and Aztec civilizations. This was largely due to their apparent similarities in artistic style and because these civilizations were better understood at the time. Uh, it's been known by archaeologists for quite a long time that there are anomalous skulls uh, in parts of Brazil. The unique aspects of Olmec art and iconography were not immediately recognized, highlighting the challenges faced by early archaeologists in differentiating between the complex cultures of the region. Two figures who played a pivotal role in bringing the wonders of Mesoamerica to the Western world were John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood. Their expeditions, documented in Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas and Yucatan, and Incidents of Travel in Yucatan, not only introduced the Maya civilization to many, but also set a standard for future archaeological work. Their detailed illustrations and engaging narratives captured the imagination of the public, sparking a wave of interest in ancient Mesoamerican cultures. This era also saw the beginnings of comparative archaeology, where discoveries from Mesoamerica were placed in a global context, offering new perspectives on the development of human societies. Museums evolved from mere collections of curiosities to centers of research and education, significantly contributing to the dissemination of knowledge about these ancient cultures. Furthermore, the late 19th and early 20th centuries witnessed the emergence of interdisciplinary approaches in archaeology, incorporating anthropology, linguistics, and even early environmental science, which enriched the understanding of Mesoamerican civilizations. The story of how the colossal stone heads became recognized as a key to understanding the Olmec civilization is a fascinating tale of curiosity, exploration, and eventual enlightenment within the archaeological world. Initially stumbled upon by Western archaeologists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, these massive sculptures, some towering over nine feet tall and weighing several tons, presented a mystery. But what's fascinating about them is they are, they are supposedly the first high civilization of Central America. With their distinctive facial features, including flat noses and fleshy cheeks and often adorned with helmet-like headgear, they captivated those who found them but left many questions unanswered. What, they, what do we think those helmets were that they were wearing? Nobody knows because no physical example of such a helmet has ever been found, just like no physical example of an Egyptian pharaoh's helm, a crown has, has ever been found. The first significant acknowledgement of these heads came from Jose Melgari Serrano in 1862, when he uncovered one at Tres Zapotes in Veracruz. Melgar described the sculpture as having Ethiopian features, a reflection of the era's interpretations and biases, underscoring how little was known about the Olmecs then. Although Melgar's discovery was groundbreaking, it was initially seen as an isolated find rather than evidence of a broader, unknown civilization. For decades, these colossal heads were viewed more as curious anomalies rather than vital cultural artifacts. 
Without a wider archaeological context, their true significance was overlooked, and they were sometimes wrongly attributed to other known civilizations like the Maya or Aztec, or even to entirely speculative, unknown cultures. It was a puzzle missing its broader picture, waiting for the pieces to be put together. The narrative began to shift in the mid-20th century, thanks to more focused and systematic excavations in the Olmec heartland, led by archaeologists such as Matthew Sterling. These efforts unearthed additional colossal heads alongside other artifacts, helping to piece together the puzzle of the Olmec civilization. It was through this dedicated work that the Olmecs were finally recognized as a distinct and influential culture in Mesoamerica, predating and potentially influencing subsequent civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs. In 1945, a groundbreaking expedition led by Matthew Sterling to San Lorenzo Tenochtitlan dramatically advanced our understanding of the Olmec civilization, an enigmatic culture that laid the foundational stones of Mesoamerican history. Recognizing the potential significance of these sites, the Smithsonian Institution stepped in, providing the necessary support and funding for a more thorough exploration. The vastness of San Lorenzo, spreading across several kilometers, presented another hurdle. It was impossible to excavate the entire site in one go, so Sterling and his team had to make strategic decisions about where to dig, prioritizing areas where surface finds indicated the presence of significant artifacts. This meticulous approach to excavation was critical, requiring careful planning, mapping, and a methodical technique to ensure the delicate artifacts, some centuries old, were preserved for future study. As they cleared the jungle overgrowth and dug into the ancient soil, Sterling's team was not just unearthing artifacts, they were also piecing together the story of the Olmec civilization. Every artifact, every stone, and every fragment of pottery added a new chapter to our understanding of this ancient culture. The detailed recording and documentation of their findings were essential, providing a basis for future analysis and helping to paint a fuller picture of the Olmec way of life. San Lorenzo, dating back to around 1200 to 900 BCE, stands as a monumental beacon in the study of Mesoamerican history, often celebrated as the oldest major city in the region. This ancient city predates the civilizations of the Maya and Aztecs, providing a unique glimpse into the dawn of complex societies in the Americas. Thanks to radiocarbon dating, researchers have been able to pin down the timeline of San Lorenzo, offering a clearer view of the Olmec civilization's early days. Among the most striking discoveries at San Lorenzo, the site has yielded jade figurines and Celts, indicating robust trade networks and the cultural significance of jade. An array of pottery styles found at the site offers insights into daily life, artistic expression, and the Olmec's trade relations. The discovery of large structures, including platforms and possible elite residences, points to a highly organized society capable of mobilizing significant labor resources. The urban layout of San Lorenzo, organized around a central axis, reflects a thoughtfully planned development. The existence of distinct ceremonial and residential areas suggests a sophisticated urban structure, possibly mirroring social hierarchies within the Olmec society. In the 1950s, the archaeological spotlight turned to La Venta, an Olmec site in Tabasco, Mexico, building on the momentum of earlier discoveries at San Lorenzo. This shift marked a significant phase in unraveling the mysteries of the Olmec civilization, regarded as one of the earliest complex societies in Mesoamerica. With a renewed interest in the Olmec culture, archaeologists like Philip Drucker and Robert Heiser applied advanced methods and interdisciplinary approaches to dig deeper into the site's secrets, offering a more comprehensive understanding of this ancient civilization. La Venta thrived between approximately 900 to 400 BCE, a period that witnessed the peak of Olmec cultural and artistic development. This era underscored the Olmec's remarkable achievements in architecture, art, and urban planning, setting a precedent for subsequent Mesoamerican cultures. Among the distinct features of La Venta is the Great Pyramid, a monumental structure made of earth and clay, noted for its unique conical shape. Unlike the pyramidal structures that would later dominate Mesoamerican landscapes, the Great Pyramid's design and scale highlight the Olmec's advanced engineering skills and their capacity for organizing large-scale construction projects. This pyramid, 
along with other structures at the site, was aligned with celestial bodies, hinting at the Olmec's sophisticated understanding of astronomy and suggesting its role as a ceremonial and cultural hub. The systematic excavation efforts at La Venta brought to light not only architectural innovations but also a wealth of artifacts, including the iconic colossal heads carved from basalt, believed to represent rulers or significant figures within Olmec society. Similarly, altars adorned with intricate carvings provided glimpses into the civilization's mythology and rituals. Leventa also revealed complex burial sites and offerings, including serpentine mosaic pavements, which offered insights into the civilization's funerary practices and religious beliefs. These findings have been instrumental in piecing together the social structure, religious practices and artistic achievements of the Olmec civilization, significantly influencing the study of Mesoamerican archaeology. However, the preservation of La Venta faces challenges due to the tropical climate and human factors, underscoring the importance of ongoing research and conservation efforts. The exploration of La Venta in the 1950s was a watershed moment in understanding the depth and complexity of the Olmec civilization, providing a foundation for future studies and ensuring the legacy of this pivotal culture in Mesoamerican history remains appreciated and preserved. It's, it's interesting that the patterns are geometrical. Someone made it, yeah. and it involved a very large amount of organized labor in order to make it. There had to be the will and the intent in order to do that. Nestled on the outskirts of Cusco, the once thriving capital of the Inca Empire, lies the enigmatic site of Sacsayhuaman. This marvel of ancient engineering has captured the imagination of historians and archaeologists alike, thanks to its remarkable architectural features. I would prefer to propose, and I have proposed, that what we're looking at is evidence of some kind of transfer of technology, that people came into that area who had other knowledge. The site, believed to have been a royal estate or a sacred space for Inca leaders, is most famous for its colossal stone walls, forming three tiered terraces that zigzag across the landscape like the teeth of some giant beast. The sheer size of the stones used, some tipping the scales at a staggering 200 tons, and the precision with which they're fitted together is nothing short of awe-inspiring. This is a very neglected area of the world, uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. The joints between these massive boulders are so meticulously crafted that they leave no space for even a sliver of paper to pass through, showcasing an advanced knowledge of stonemasonry and perhaps an understanding of seismic activities as these structures have withstood numerous earthquakes over the centuries. While mainstream archaeology attributes these feats to the Inca's sophisticated engineering skills, using simple but effective tools and techniques, Graham Hancock invites us to ponder a more mysterious origin. A curious mystery that is not unconnected to the genetic mystery. He speculates that the Inca might have been heirs to a legacy of knowledge and technology from a bygone civilization, now lost to history. This theory suggests that the astonishing precision and durability of Sacsayhuaman's walls could be evidence of an advanced pre-Inca society that had mastered construction techniques far beyond what was previously imagined for their time. Hancock's fascination doesn't stop at the construction techniques. He delves into the site's possible acoustic properties and astronomical alignments, suggesting that Sacsayhuaman was not just an architectural marvel, but also a center for astronomical observation and sound engineering. These features hint at a sophisticated understanding of the cosmos and sound, further fueling the speculation that the site's creators were far more advanced than we give them credit for. The mystery of Sacsayhuaman is deepened by the Inca's lack of a written language, which has led to a significant loss of their oral history following the Spanish conquest. This absence of concrete historical records leaves a gap in our understanding of the site's true purpose and the extent of the Inca's architectural knowledge. Despite these challenges, Sacsayhuaman's cultural and historical significance cannot be overstated. As a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it attracts thousands of tourists each year, serving as a vital link to the past and a testament to the Inca civilization's ingenuity. Now, the story of the Inca Empire, or Tawantinsuyu, this narrative takes us back to the early 13th century, around the region of Cusco in what's now Peru. It's here that the saga begins with Manco Capac, 
the mythical founder and first emperor believed to be chosen by the sun god Inti himself. From such divine origins, the Inca embarked on an ambitious journey of expansion, blending military might and diplomatic savvy to weave together a tapestry of conquered territories and assimilated cultures. At its zenith, this empire spanned modern-day Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, Argentina, Chile and Colombia, creating the largest empire in pre-Columbian America. But what truly sets the Inca apart are their engineering marvels. Imagine a network of roads over 40,000 kilometers long, connecting the arid coastlines of Peru to the snow-capped Andes, a testament to the Inca's engineering genius. This wasn't just any road system, it was the Capac Ñan, or the Royal Road, a feat of ancient infrastructure that included everything from stone-paved paths to suspension bridges made of woven grass. These pathways were vital arteries of the empire, supported by tambos and storehouses that provided essential supplies to travelers and military expeditions alike. Yet, the Inca's ingenuity didn't stop at roadways. They transformed the steep Andean mountainsides with agricultural terraces, preventing erosion and expanding arable land, all while developing sophisticated irrigation systems to water these terraced fields. Their expertise in water management extended to canals and aqueducts that channeled water from mountain springs to dry areas, ensuring the survival of dense populations. The heart of this empire was Cusco, a city that was not only the political center but also an urban planning marvel. Cusco was divided into sectors that mirrored the four parts of the empire, each sector meticulously planned and organized. And then there's Machu Picchu, the crown jewel of Inca architecture, perched high in the mountains and blending seamlessly with the landscape. This iconic site, with its terraces, temples and palaces, showcases the Inca's unparalleled skill in stonework, stone so precisely cut and fitted that they've withstood centuries of earthquakes. Now moving back to Graham Hancock, a name synonymous with challenging the traditional narratives of history and archaeology, has long fascinated us with his theories on the ancient world. Are we looking at the traces of a forgotten episode in human history? I think so. I think that's, that's what's going on here. He suggests that civilizations like the Inca were not only more technologically advanced, but also more interconnected than we've been led to believe. Let's take a closer look at some of the intriguing ideas Hancock puts forward. First off, consider the Inca's ingenious system of communication. They had these runners known as Chasqui, who could sprint across the empire's vast network of roads and trails, passing messages with incredible efficiency. But it wasn't just about legwork. The Inca also used Kuipers, complex knot patterns on strings that may have been more than mere accounting tools. Hancock muses that these could have carried detailed messages, perhaps even stories across vast distances. He even floats the idea that there might have been even more sophisticated yet undiscovered methods of communication, hinting at a possible global network of ancient knowledge sharing. Then there's the matter of construction techniques. The precision seen in the stonework of sites like Saksai Waman is staggering. Without mortar, these stones have been cut and fitted together so perfectly that they've withstood earthquakes for centuries. Hancock suggests this might point to lost technologies, far more advanced than what's been historically acknowledged. Perhaps a decision Where was made not to use metal. Perhaps a decision was made that uh, errors had taken place, that, that, that in reinventing civilization, we shouldn't perhaps go down quite the same route as before. And it's not just about stones and construction. He speculates the Inca had ways to harness natural energies, like geothermal or solar energy, in ways we're yet to fully understand. Hancock doesn't stop there. He observes how the Inca's agricultural practices from terracing to sophisticated irrigation showcase a sustainable way of living with the environment, possibly part of a broader, now lost knowledge of ancient civilizations. This idea of sustainability, coupled with their architectural and engineering feats, paints a picture of a society that was not only advanced but deeply in tune with the natural world. Moreover, Hancock draws parallels between the architectural styles, religious beliefs and cultural practices across different ancient civilizations. The similarities in megalithic constructions across South America, Egypt and Asia, the use of psychoactive plants in spiritual rituals, and even practices like cranial deformation and mummification suggest a web of cultural exchange or influence that spans the globe. Graham Hancock, a name often associated with thinking outside of the box, among his many interests, the Inca Empire stands out for its sophisticated communication networks and astronomical know-how, 
areas where Hancock's ideas veer sharply from the mainstream narrative. Hancock looks at the Inca's architectural marvels, like the precision-engineered Temple of the Sun at Machu Picchu, and sees a civilization deeply in tune with the cosmos. These buildings weren't just about looking pretty. They aligned with celestial events like the solstices and equinoxes, serving both practical agricultural needs and the ceremonial calendar. It's this star-aligned architecture that leads Hancock to ponder if the Inca's cosmic knowledge was inherited from an even older global civilization, suggesting a world where ancient peoples shared a sophisticated understanding of astronomy long before it was thought possible. Hancock's theories, while met with skepticism from the academic establishment, undeniably add zest to the ongoing dialogue about our ancestors. By proposing that the Inca were part of a technologically advanced and interconnected ancient world, he challenges us to rethink what we thought we knew about the past. Whether you're a believer or a skeptic, Hancock's insights into the Inca Empire invite us all to explore the mysteries of ancient civilizations with fresh eyes, reminding us that history is anything but written in stone. But what's fascinating about them is they are, they are supposedly the first high civilization of Central America, that they create structures on a massive scale that you can see connections between them and the later, the later Maya. For the Maya, the Milky Way was a particularly important feature of the heavens. They conceived of it as the road that led to their netherworld, Zibalba. In the verdant lands of Central America, the ancient Maya civilization flourished with a mysterious brilliance that continues to captivate the world. Among the many enigmas they left behind, their profound understanding of astronomy stands as a testament to their intellectual prowess. Graham Hancock, a modern explorer of ancient mysteries, delves deep into this aspect of the Maya, proposing intriguing theories that stretch the bounds of conventional history. That whole mystery of the Mayan calendar was clearly inherited from the Olmecs. It wasn't something the Maya made up. The Olmecs used that same symbolism. So the Mayan calendar is actually an Olmec calendar. The Maya long count calendar, a marvel of ancient engineering, intricately tracked a 5,125-year cycle with astonishing precision. This calendar wasn't just a tool for marking time. It was a complex understanding of celestial cycles, intertwining the Maya's daily lives with the cosmos. Hancock suggests that this precision hints at a deeper, possibly inherited, knowledge of astronomy. Was this sophisticated understanding a legacy from a much older, now lost civilization? When one looks at the grandeur of Maya structures such as the pyramid at Chichen Itza, the brilliance of their astronomical alignment is striking. During the equinoxes, the play of light and shadow on this pyramid creates the illusion of a serpent slithering down its steps. To Hancock, these architectural marvels are not just buildings, but celestial maps, echoing an advanced understanding of the cosmos. Orion was extensively involved in Mayan rebirth beliefs, which described the constellation and specifically its three belt stars as the turtle of rebirth. In Egypt, as amongst the Maya, the stellar context involves Orion and the Milky Way. The Maya's awareness of the ecliptic, the path followed by the sun, moon, and planets across the sky, further fuels Hancock's theories. Their ability to predict solar and lunar eclipses and track the movements of Venus, which they revered as the god Kukulkan, showcases their deep astronomical knowledge. Did they learn this from an older civilization? Hancock wonders. A civilization lost in the depths of time. Hancock theorizes that the Maya might have been part of a vast network of ancient civilizations, sharing knowledge across seas and continents. This global maritime culture, as he envisages, could have been a conduit for transferring advanced astronomical and architectural knowledge to the Maya. The architectural designs of the Maya, seen in their pyramids, temples, and cities, reflect a level of technological and engineering skill that seems almost ahead of their time. Were these skills handed down from a previous, more advanced civilization? The mathematical systems of the Maya, including their use of zero, a concept rare in the ancient world, were integral to their astronomical calculations. Hancock proposes that this mathematical sophistication, too, might be a legacy from a forgotten civilization. We're not what it's all about at all. Uh, that there may have been an earlier civilization that reached a high level of advancement, perhaps different from ours, but nevertheless an advanced civilization, which was just 
taken out of the story completely by a global cataclysm. In a tale woven from the threads of ancient mysteries, Graham Hancock, a modern-day seeker of lost truths, presents a fascinating theory. He imagines a world where an advanced civilization, predating the ancient cultures known to history, once thrived. This civilization, possibly flourishing before the last ice age ended around 10,000 BCE, was a beacon of knowledge in fields like astronomy, architecture, and mathematics. Hancock's story tells of a society whose influence stretched far beyond its own time and space, touching various corners of the ancient world, including the enigmatic Maya civilization. I think, and it's my case, that it wiped our memory of a previous episode of, of human civilization, that right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization, which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. However, this ancient global society in Hancock's story faced a dramatic and catastrophic end. He hypothesizes that a cataclysmic event, such as a comet impact or a massive flood, nearly obliterated this civilization, but not all was lost. The survivors, carrying the torch of their advanced knowledge, ventured out into the world. These bearers of ancient wisdom found their way to other, less advanced societies and shared their knowledge, planting the seeds for new civilizations to grow. Among these were the Maya, who, in Hancock's view, may have been one of the many inheritors of this ancient legacy. Hancock points to the Maya's remarkable architectural and astronomical achievements as evidence of this influence. The precision of their calendar systems, their understanding of celestial cycles, and the alignment of their buildings with astronomical events are, in his narrative, not just the fruits of their own ingenuity but possibly a heritage from a civilization lost in the mists of time. He draws parallels between the architectural styles, religious beliefs, and astronomical knowledge found across various ancient cultures suggesting these similarities might be remnants of a shared source of ancient wisdom. Because we now know that at that time, between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, truly global cataclysmic events involving rapid rises in sea level yeah. uh, did occur, and suddenly the, the worldwide tradition of a, of a global flood stops being just a myth and starts being a memory. In a narrative that intertwines the mysteries of ancient seas with the Maya calendar, Graham Hancock, a storyteller of history's hidden chapters, brings to life his theories of a bygone era. He paints a picture of an ancient world, not fragmented by vast oceans, but connected through them. This world, according to Hancock, was home to a sophisticated global maritime culture. This culture, adept in the art of navigation and shipbuilding, embarked on extensive sea voyages, knitting together the far-flung civilizations of the ancient world. Hancock's tale is not just about the movement of ships, but also about the flow of ideas, technologies, and beliefs. He sees the similarities in architectural styles and construction techniques across different ancient cultures as whispers of a shared knowledge, possibly disseminated through this maritime network. In this story, ancient seafarers are the unsung heroes, ferrying not just goods, but also the seeds of culture and religion across the world's watery expanse. He draws parallels with the Polynesian navigators, known for their remarkable oceanic voyages, suggesting that similar capabilities could have existed among these ancient maritime cultures. They're telling us that uh, this lost civilization was submerged in a great flood around 11,600 years before our time. This is why I think we need to pay attention to the Atlantis story rather than just write it off as the ravings of the lunatic fringe. But Hancock's narrative takes an intriguing turn as he touches upon the mysterious Maya civilization and their long count calendar. This calendar, a sophisticated timekeeping system, tracks a cycle of approximately 5,125 years, culminating in a date that modern calendars align with December 21st, 2012. Hancock, weaving a tale from the threads of time, views this not as an apocalyptic end, but as a significant moment in Maya cosmology, a marker of major transition or transformation. In this story, the 2012 phenomenon is not a tale of doom, but a moment of cosmological significance, possibly indicating a shift in human consciousness or the dawn of a new era in human history. 
Hancock uses this moment to discuss the broader concept of historical cycles, how ancient civilizations understood and measured time, and their alignment with astronomical events such as the precession of the equinoxes and the galaxy's alignment. Graham Hancock, a modern-day chronicler of lost civilizations, presents a captivating theory. He tells a story of Earth's history punctuated by cataclysmic events, asteroid impacts, massive floods, and volcanic eruptions that have periodically reshaped the course of human civilization. In this tale, these cataclysms are not just natural disasters, but pivotal moments that lead to the rise and fall of civilizations, causing a reset of human progress. This is quite a famous uh, phenomenon of, in, in Turkey, that there are huge cities, they look like ant farms on an enormous scale that are dug out under the earth. Hundreds and hundreds of rooms that huge efforts was put into digging deep beneath the earth and creating these shelters. Nestled in the heart of Turkey's enchanting Cappadocia region lies Derinkuyu, an ancient underground city that stands as a monument to the ingenuity and resilience of bygone civilizations. Its fascinating origins, complex construction and versatile uses offer a glimpse into a community that sought refuge beneath the Earth's surface, crafting a hidden world of remarkable depth and complexity. And archaeology does not have a good explanation about what they're there for, or why they were built, or when they were built. They're all cut out of stone. You can only date objects that were left in them. You can't say when they were actually made. The story of Derinkuyu begins in the 8th, 7th centuries BCE, with the Phrygians, an Indo-European people renowned for their architectural skills, laying its foundation. What likely started as a modest subterranean enclave was expanded by successive cultures, each adding layers of depth and function to this architectural marvel. Notably, in the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD, early Christians seeking sanctuary from Roman persecution carved out additional living quarters, worship spaces and communal areas. They were used by Christians, uh, they were used by Muslims, they were used um, back in uh, 2,000 plus years ago as homes in some cases. The construction of Derinkuyu was no small feat. It involved the excavation of approximately 2.5 million cubic meters of volcanic rock, known as tuff, which is soft enough to carve but hardens when exposed to air, ensuring stability for the city's expansive underground structures. Derinkuyu's purpose extended far beyond a mere hideout, it was a bastion during invasions and conflicts in the strategically significant region of Cappadocia. What makes sense of those underground cities to me is that they were built as places of refuge that people could go into during an episode of meteor bombardment during the Younger Dryas. Beyond serving as a refuge, it also offered a complete underground living environment with water wells, food storage, livestock pens and even a prison. They're fine. They have air vents, they have water, they're, they're incredibly well thought out. Its intricate layout supported a vibrant community life, with residential areas, communal kitchens and places of worship, reflecting a society capable of sophisticated urban planning and social organisation. The city's capacity to house up to 20,000 people, coupled with its advanced infrastructure, including an extensive ventilation system and a complex water distribution network, speaks volumes about the ancient world's architectural and engineering prowess. I spent hours down there just wandering around and looking at this, this, this amazing place. Of particular note is Derinkuyu's significance to early Christians, who found not just a safe haven, but a spiritual sanctuary within its depths. The numerous chapels and churches adorned with religious symbols and bas-reliefs provided a focal point for community and faith underscoring the city's importance as a religious retreat. Derinkuyu, an underground world equivalent to an 18-storey building below the Earth's surface. This ancient city, carved deep into the Earth to a depth of around 200 feet, provided a year-round comfortable living environment. Thanks to its cooler and more stable temperatures, it's fascinating to think about how it was designed to house up to 20,000 people, along with their livestock and possessions, showcasing an incredibly organized society, adept at managing life's necessities in such a confined yet complex space. With at least 18 levels, Derinkuyu was more than just a series of tunnels. It was a fully functioning underground metropolis. 
The city was meticulously organized into residential areas, communal spaces, and even sectors for livestock indicating a society that valued structure and community. The intricate layout ensured that despite being underground, movement within the city was fluid. The city's innovative ventilation system is nothing short of remarkable. Thousands of shafts ensured that fresh air reached the deepest levels, a feat that underscores an advanced understanding of environmental control and airflow. This system was crucial for not only providing fresh air, but also for dispersing smoke from cooking and lighting, maintaining air quality for the large population residing within. But perhaps what stands out most about Daring Kuyu are its defensive features. Massive stone doors could be rolled across passages to seal off the city, transforming it into a fortress at a moment's notice. The corridors, intentionally narrow, were designed to thwart large groups of invaders, allowing defenders to control movement throughout the city effectively. Moreover, the hidden entrances and exits, some connected to the surface by miles-long tunnels, speak volumes about the strategic planning that went into safeguarding the city. These secret passages allowed for stealthy entrances and exits, crucial for gathering intelligence or making escapes during sieges. Despite the extensive exploration that has peeled back some of its layers, Derinkuyu keeps parts of itself hidden, teasing the imagination with what lies in its uncharted depths. While we've uncovered much, there's still a vast expanse that remains out of reach. Safety concerns and the potential risk of collapse have kept certain sections off-limits, sparking a wildfire of speculation and theories about the full scale of this underground labyrinth. Could there be entire levels we've yet to discover, or hidden rooms filled with ancient artifacts waiting to tell their part of Derinkuyu's tale? The lore surrounding Derinkuyu and its sister cities in Cappadocia weaves a rich tapestry of tales that blur the lines between history and legend. Stories of a vast network of tunnels connecting the underground cities suggest a sophisticated system used for trade, communication, or even as escape routes from invaders. The, the two that I visited in the series are, are Derinkuyu and Kaimakli, and these two sites are joined by an eight-kilometer tunnel underground. While some of these tunnels have been confirmed, the full extent of this network fuels the imagination about the capabilities of ancient civilizations, speculation about Derinkuyu's past ventures into the realms of the extraordinary with some suggesting it might have been a refugee for extraterrestrial visitors or a remnant of a lost advanced civilization. Although such theories stretch beyond the bounds of established archaeological evidence, they underscore the fascination daring Kuyu incites, reflecting the human penchant for mystery and the unexplained. Daring Kuyu is a hidden gem that tells a tale of human resilience, architectural mastery, and the intricate history of Anatolia. This ancient underground city, a sanctuary carved from the earth, speaks volumes about the lengths to which people will go to protect their beliefs, their culture, and their way of life. Imagine a time between the 1st and 3rd centuries AD when early Christians facing relentless persecution from the Roman Empire sought refuge beneath the earth's surface. Derinkuyu became their sanctuary, a place where they could practice their faith in secret away from the oppressive gaze of Roman authorities. Within this subterranean haven, they carved out chapels and churches, adorning them with frescoes that depicted scenes from the Bible and Christian iconography, creating a space that was not just about survival, but about preserving their spiritual and cultural identity. But Derinkuyu was not an isolated refuge, it was part of a vast network of underground cities in Cappadocia, connected by miles of tunnels. These connections weren't just for escape or hiding, they represented a sophisticated system for trade, communication and strategic movement, highlighting an advanced level of social organization and urban planning in ancient Cappadocia. This network of cities underlines the region's significance as a cultural and economic hub, showcasing the ingenuity of its people in creating a cohesive and cooperative community. The modern rediscovery of Derinkuyu is as fascinating as its history, in 1963, a local stumbled upon a mysterious room behind a wall in his home, unveiling the entrance to this ancient city. This discovery captured the imagination of historians, archaeologists and the wider public, leading to the exploration of the city and its eventual opening to tourists. Today, Derinkuyu is not just an archaeological site, 
It's a major tourist attraction that draws people from all over the world eager to explore its ancient passageways, chapels, and the incredible engineering behind its construction. Derinkuyu's significance has been recognized on a global scale, as it, along with other sites in the Cappadocia region, has been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This honor speaks to its value to humanity, preserving its history and architecture for future generations. The city stands as a symbol of what humans are capable of achieving when faced with existential threats, creating safe havens of remarkable complexity and beauty. Beyond its historical and architectural value, Derinkuyu serves as an educational resource, offering insights into ancient construction techniques, community living, and survival strategies. It continues to inspire and educate, reminding us of the depths of human ingenuity and the enduring spirit of communities that have faced adversity throughout history. One thing that they used to say is, Hancock can't be right because there was no global cataclysm, you know, 12 or 13,000 years ago. Well, now we know there was, and there are various explanations for it. Right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. Graham Hancock's interpretation of the Piri Reis map, created in 1513 by the Ottoman admiral and cartographer Piri Reis, presents a fascinating narrative about the knowledge of ancient civilizations. The map, discovered in 1929 in the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, Turkey, has only about one third of its original content preserved. Despite this, the map's detail and coverage including parts of Europe, North Africa, and the Brazilian coast, are noteworthy. The scale of the map is inconsistent, a common feature in early cartography, and it includes various annotations and illustrations. This is a very neglected area of the world, uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. If you're going to propose a lost civilization, you need, there are certain preconditions. Piri Reis himself indicated that the map was compiled using various earlier sources, including charts from Christopher Columbus and possibly older maps, which might have included Western and Eastern, including Arabic navigational charts. Hancock's interpretation of the map primarily focuses on its depiction of the Antarctic coastline. He claims that the map shows the northern coastline of Antarctica in a largely ice-free state, which, according to him, last occurred more than 6,000 years ago. This assertion, if true, would imply a significant historical anomaly, suggesting that ancient seafarers might have charted Antarctica long before it was officially discovered. However, this interpretation is contentious, Critics argue that the so-called Antarctic coast could be a misrepresentation or misinterpretation of the South American coast, or even an imaginative addition, not uncommon in early cartography. In 1513, when Piri Reis uh, drew the map, Antarctica had not been discovered. Uh, in fact, it wasn't discovered until 1880 by our civilization. It incorporates highly accurate relative longitudes. To do longitudes accurately on maps requires a chronometer, a marine chronometer that will keep accurate time at sea. And again, this was something that our civilization couldn't do until the late 18th century. Another intriguing aspect of the Piri Reis map, according to Hancock, is its accuracy in longitude in certain sections. He posits that this level of accuracy indicates a more advanced knowledge of navigation and geography than what was available at the time. However, this claim is debated by scholars who argue that the accuracies could be coincidental or exaggerated since accurate methods for measuring longitude were not developed until the 18th century. Hancock also suggests that the map depicts mountain ranges in Antarctica, which were unknown and under ice until recent times. This, he believes, further points to ancient knowledge of geography. Critics, however, counter that these features could be inaccuracies, such as misdrawn coastlines or symbolic illustrations, rather than representations of actual geographical features. Graham Hancock's hypothesis about advanced ancient knowledge, particularly as seen through the lens of ancient maps like the Piri Rice map, certainly stirs up a conversation about our understanding of historical and archaeological knowledge. Hancock points out that these maps display a level of geographical detail that seems remarkably accurate, especially when you consider the time they were created. For example, the Piri Reis map, which includes detailed coastlines and island locations, seems to suggest a level of knowledge that surpasses what was known or should have been possible at the time. 
It's quite intriguing, really. One of the more captivating aspects of Hancock's theory is the suggestion that some of these maps show features that were not officially recognized until much later. Well, this map was drawn in 1813. It's the Pinkerton world map. Um, and it's based on the latest science available in 1813. So Antarctica isn't there. Why isn't Antarctica there? Because it's an honest map. They hadn't discovered it in 1813. So it's very odd in my view that Antarctica appears on much older source ma maps, which themselves are based on even older source maps. Um, Take, for instance, his interpretation of the Antarctic coast as depicted on the Piri Reis map, a region not known in the 16th century. This leads Hancock to speculate that these maps could have been based on even older sources, possibly from a forgotten civilization that had extensively charted the globe. It's as if he's hinting at a lost chapter in human history, one that recorded the Earth with surprising accuracy and detail. When we dive into the technological implications of his theory, things get even more interesting. Hancock suggests that the creators of these original source maps must have had advanced navigational skills, including the accurate measurement of longitude. A significant challenge that wasn't resolved until much later with the invention of marine chronometers in the 18th century. The precision in these maps, particularly in terms of latitudinal and longitudinal readings, implies a level of cartographic sophistication that seems out of place in the historical timeline as we understand it. It's as if these map makers had tools and knowledge that history says they shouldn't have had. Graham Hancock's ideas about the loss and transmission of ancient knowledge are quite captivating, weaving together a narrative that stretches across time and civilizations. He proposes that a wealth of geographical knowledge, once possessed by an advanced ancient civilization, was largely lost due to cataclysmic events or perhaps the gradual decline of this civilization. It's a, it's a navigational device, it's, uh, it, it, it's a geared, cogged, a mm. system that allows you to track the passage of time and figure out where you are. Again, that testifies to a lost navigational skill that, yes. we, that we have not taken account of. Before. It's a thought-provoking idea, suggesting that what we know of our past might just be the tip of the iceberg. Hancock believes that some remnants of this knowledge managed to survive and eventually influence the cartographic work of later civilizations, including those in the medieval and renaissance periods. Hancock delves into how this information could have been passed down. He suggests a variety of channels, including oral traditions, mythological texts, and even surviving cartographic materials, which later mapmakers like Piri Reis might have used. Imagine, for a moment, ancient mariners passing down stories of distant lands and seas, with these tales eventually finding their way into the maps and charts of later generations. One of the more intriguing aspects of Hancock's hypothesis is his connection with myths and legends from different cultures around the world. He often draws parallels between these stories and the idea of advanced prehistoric knowledge and global cataclysms, such as the great flood narratives found in many cultures. In Hancock's view, these myths and legends aren't just fanciful stories, they're potential historical records, allegorical but based on real events and knowledge from these lost civilizations. It's a narrative that challenges us to think beyond conventional historical accounts, suggesting that our ancestors might have known far more about the world than we give them credit for. You see, the, the, the one thing there's no dispute about anymore uh, is that the Younger Dryas was a cataclysm. The, 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 the megafauna that, uh, that, that die off, the disruption of human activity that takes place at that time, the huge climate changes, this was a cataclysm by any standards. Where the argument still goes on is what caused the, what caused the cataclysm. Graham Hancock has this really interesting, if somewhat controversial, hypothesis about a global cataclysm that he believes occurred around 10,600 BCE. He suggests that Earth was hit by a comet or a series of comet impacts at this time, leading to massive environmental and climatic upheavals worldwide. This idea is particularly interesting because he links it to the Younger Dryas period, a well-documented era of abrupt climate change that started around 12,900 years ago and lasted for about 1,300 years. The Younger Dryas is known for a sudden shift back to colder and drier conditions following a period of warming after the last ice age. Hancock posits that this comet impact could have been the trigger for this dramatic climatic shift. What's intriguing is how Hancock uses ice core samples from Greenland and Antarctica to support his theory. These ice cores, which provide a detailed record of past temperatures and atmospheric compositions, show evidence of a rapid climatic change during the Younger Dryas. 
He sees this as a smoking gun, indicating a major impact event. He also points to geological evidence like sediment layers that show signs of sudden environmental changes, further supporting his comet impact theory. We see all the megafauna dying off suddenly and rapidly. We see rises in sea level. We see a huge collapse in, in global temperature. What is becoming clearer and, and clearer uh, is that the evidence that a comet behind it was behind it is, is extremely strong. But Hancock doesn't stop there. He goes on to suggest that this hypothesized comet impact had profound effects on both flora and fauna, including contributing to the extinction of many large mammal species during what's known as the Pleistocene megafauna extinction. The changes in vegetation and ecosystems, he argues, would have had cascading effects on wildlife and human populations alike. For human societies, Hancock believes this event was catastrophic, causing significant disruptions and leading to the loss of advanced knowledge and cultural practices of prehistoric civilizations. It's like he's suggesting a kind of cultural amnesia, where societies forgot the advancements they had made. And then there's this fascinating idea that survivors of this cataclysm might have passed on fragments of their advanced knowledge to other cultures, influencing the development of future civilizations. It's a narrative that makes you wonder about the connections between ancient civilizations and how knowledge could have been transferred across generations and geographies in ways we might not fully understand. For a long time it was held that the Neanderthals were stupid, primitive subhumans, shambling, lacking symbolism. Turns out that that's not true at all. Certain populations in the world today still have three to five percent of Neanderthal uh, DNA. Tucked away in the rugged terrains of the Altai Mountains, where the borders of Russia, China, Mongolia and Kazakhstan meet, lies a fascinating piece of history that has captured the imaginations of archaeologists and historians alike. The Denisova Cave. This is uh, a, a, an issue that I go into in, in America before. And what first drew me into it was uh, Denisova Cave mm -hmm. uh, in Siberia. This isn't just any cave, it's a treasure trove of human evolution nestled in an area known for its breathtaking biodiversity and complex geological history. The mountains themselves are alive with a rich variety of plants and animals, setting the perfect backdrop for a story that's as much about the natural world as it is about our ancient ancestors. I think everybody's heard of the Neanderthals, and these days I think everybody's heard of the Denisovans as well. The story of Denisova Cave began to unfold in the 1970s, when Soviet scientists first explored its depths. At that time, their eyes were set on unravelling the geological and paleontological mysteries of the region, largely overlooking the cave's potential to unlock secrets of our past. It's named after Denis, an 18th century hermit who once called the cave home, adding a touch of human history to its ancient walls. With its intricate network of chambers and galleries, the cave hinted at stories of long-term habitation by early humans, waiting just beneath the surface to be discovered. But it wasn't until 2008 that the cave truly stepped into the spotlight, thanks to the discovery of a small finger bone. In Russia, in Denisova Cave, they find a single pinky bone from a little finger. And what they discover is, this isn't a Neanderthal, this isn't an anatomically modern human being, this is another human species. This wasn't just any bone, it belonged to the Denisovans, an ancient group of hominins previously unknown to science. Suddenly the world was paying attention, eager to learn more about these mysterious inhabitants. The cave, with its rich layers of history buried within, revealed that it had been a bustling crossroads for different groups over tens of thousands of years. What's particularly intriguing about the Denisova cave is not just its archaeological wealth, but also its location. Nestled in a remote part of the Altai Mountains, reaching it is no small feat. The harsh climatic conditions add an extra layer of challenge for those daring enough to explore its secrets. Yet it's precisely these obstacles that make the cave so alluring to researchers from across the globe. Every expedition brings us closer to understanding not just the Denisovans, but the broader narrative of human history. Imagine stumbling upon a piece of the puzzle that is human history hidden away in the depths of Siberia's Denisova cave. The Denisovans are a bit of a mystery, genetically distinct from both modern humans and Neanderthals. Their DNA tells us they branched off from Neanderthals around 400,000 years ago, 
enriching the narrative of the Pleistocene era's human saga. But when it comes to what they looked like, we're mostly in the dark. Our clues? Just a finger bone, a few teeth, and a piece of skull. Though these fragments are robust, they hint at Denisovans being well equipped for surviving the tough Pleistocene Asia. Now here's where it gets really interesting. The Denisovans didn't just keep to themselves, they left a mark on us modern humans. Certain groups today, especially in Asia and Oceania, carry Denisovan DNA. For instance, the indigenous people of Melanesia, including Papua New Guineans, have about 5% of their DNA from Denisovans. This reveals a history of ancient interbreeding that is more complex and common than we ever imagined. Anatomically modern humans interbred with Neanderthals. You can't interbreed with another species. They, they clearly were uh, hum human beings. Denisovans mixed not just with modern humans, but also Neanderthals and possibly another yet unidentified ancient human group. But what about their way of life? The Denisova cave has given us a glimpse, yielding sophisticated tools, a bone needle, and even jewelry. These finds suggest a culture and level of sophistication that challenges our understanding of archaic humans. Their discovery of the Denisovans has been a game changer in evolutionary biology, painting a picture of our past that's far more intricate than previously thought. It's not just about who we are, but who we're connected to, revealing a web of interactions among ancient human species across Eurasia. Yet for all we've learned, the Denisovans remain shrouded in mystery. With each fossil fragment and DNA sequence, scientists are slowly piecing together the jigsaw of our ancient past. The Denisovan genome in particular continues to be a treasure trove of information, promising to unlock even more secrets as research progresses. This story is far from over. It's an ongoing journey of discovery into who we are and where we come from. Siberia's Yakutia region, known for its jaw-dropping temperature extremes, is home to a place as intriguing as its ominous name suggests, the Valley of Death. Tucked away in the northeastern part of Siberia, in the Saka Republic, this valley is not just a testament to nature's extremes, but also a canvas for mysteries that boggle the mind. What sets this valley apart are the curious metallic structures scattered across its landscape. Picture this, dome-like formations and metal objects, some peeking out of the earth as if partially buried treasures all wrapped in a mystery. Are they ancient artifacts, remnants of meteorite impacts, or something else? The truth is, we're still scratching our heads trying to figure it out. Getting to the Valley of Death is an adventure in itself, it's remote, wildly inhospitable, and the weather swings from scorching summers to winters that would give even the hardiest explorer pause. This makes studying those mysterious structures all the more challenging. Local folklore adds layers of intrigue to the valley. The Yakut people have tales that could make your hair stand on end associating the valley and its metallic mysteries with danger and otherworldly energies. According to legend, these structures could wield unknown powers causing illness or worse to those who dare too close. While these stories add to the valley's mystique, they remain unverified whispers of the past. Scientists, on their part, have theories that could explain the existence of these structures. Some suggest they might be the aftermath of meteorite impacts, pointing to Siberia's history with celestial events like the famous Tunguska explosion. Others speculate they could be the work of ancient humans or a civilization lost to time, leaving behind these puzzling artifacts. But here's the rub. Actually exploring this area is incredibly tough. The extreme climate, the area's seclusion and the sheer lack of infrastructure make sustained research difficult. This scarcity of empirical data means much about the Valley of Death remains a tantalizing mystery. This shroud of mystery isn't just a magnet for scientists. Historians, paranormal enthusiasts, and even adventurous tourists are drawn to its secrets. The allure of uncovering more about Siberia's ancient past and its uncharted territories is irresistible. As technology and exploration methods improve, who knows what secrets will unearth from the Valley of Death until then, it remains one of Siberia's most captivating enigmas a place where history, legend, and science converge in the most mysterious of dances. Let's dive into one of Siberia's most mind-boggling mysteries that the Tunguska event of 1908. Imagine a blast so powerful it flattens 80 million trees 
over an area of 2,150 square kilometers. That's exactly what happened near the Podkamanaya Tunguska River in central Siberia on June 30, 1908. This wasn't just any old explosion, it was roughly 1,000 times mightier than the Hiroshima atomic bomb. The shock waves from this colossal blast were felt up to 2,000 kilometers away. People at the time reported seeing a bright blue light, almost like a second sun, followed by a series of booms that were strong enough to knock folks off their feet and shatter windows hundreds of kilometers away. Fast forward to 1927 and enter Leonid Kulik, a Russian mineralogist who was the first to scientifically investigate the site. Kulik was expecting to find a meteorite crater, but was met instead with a sea of flattened trees splayed out from a central point like the spokes of a wheel with not a crater in sight. The most accepted theory a small asteroid or comet fragment burst through the atmosphere, exploding 5 to 10 kilometers above ground with the force of 10-15 megatons of TNT. But as with all good mysteries, there are other angles, everything from a natural gas explosion from the Earth's belly to wilder notions like antimatter or even a mini black hole having a run-in with our planet. The aftermath of this explosion wasn't just a big patch of knockdown trees, it had a significant environmental punch, boosting tree growth in the area and reportedly causing genetic mutations in plants and animals, likely thanks to the extreme heat and shockwave it even had a hand in global atmospheric changes, like the creation of night shining clouds and a dip in atmospheric transparency across Europe and Asia. But here's where it gets even juicier. The Tunguska event has been a hotbed for conspiracy theories and wild speculation. From alien spacecraft crashes to top-secret weapon tests, the event's mysterious nature has sparked imaginations worldwide. Despite decades of research and countless theories, the Tunguska event remains one of the 20th century's most tantalizing unsolved mysteries. It's a real-life sci-fi story set in the remote Siberian wilderness that continues to intrigue and puzzle us to this day.